Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Westview Community Church. It is graduation weekend, so I know we have a number of guests here today. We're glad that you chose to worship with us today, and we're glad you're here. We pray for everybody's safe travel to and from here, but today we're going to uh, tackle this last sermon in a series, and I, I want to talk about this element of earth that has always existed, and it is an element of earth that fascinates humankind. It fascinated humankind from the very first days to it fascinates us today. Do you know what that element is? Man, you guys are right on fire. It's right here. I should have walked over and gave you a hint, but it's, it's this. Watch this. Fire. Say, say, ah, come on, ooh. See, several of you are in a trance already. It's just like we're drawn to fire. What is it about fire that draws us? You know, first you think about fire actually sustains us. Fire, if you look up and see that sun, it's a big ball of what? Fire. It's a big ball of fire. It sustains our life. Warmth sustains our life. But even more than that, fire attracts us because fire is also comfort. Like for us here in Kansas in winter, there's nothing like a fire in a fireplace, right? And put your feet up and grab a good book. Or it's also, it has this other element, the fire attracts us because it's so cohesive, especially in the older days where we didn't have electricity. You gathered around fire because of its comfort, but you also gathered around because it's light. And you need that light, so it would draw us all together. But also, there's other ways that fire still attracts us. And guys, I think you know this one. Like, you got a special date, right? And so you got, you got this special moment for your loved one. So you invite him over for dinner, but just ahead of time, you're microwaving that TV dinner, and you're scraping it into a plate to make it look like you cooked it, right? And you're sitting there, and you get all set up, and there's like, there's still something missing. It's like, ah, candle, because it brings fire Romance, right? It's like fire. We use fire for romance. But also, fire brings danger and it brings power. And I think that's what fascinates us. In March, when we watch the burning Flint Hills here, it's power. We just get around a bonfire and just the power of fire. But the one thing that we know about fire is it always attracts. Fire attracts. Fire can bring thousands into the street to watch it. As a matter of fact, this recent event, you'll know did exactly that. Watch this. Finally, the mayor of Paris saying much of the body of the cathedral tonight appears to have been saved and the iconic two towers amid prayers below. Tonight, the people of Paris, the French and so many tourists, Americans among them, watching in horror and disbelief. Others praying as their national treasure, their lady, Notre Dame, went up in flames. They drew comfort in song. Notre Dame, Notre Dame. a tragic story to where a fire in a church brings thousands into the streets and so a lot of us remember it wasn't that long ago but it's amazing already what the rebuild has already done on that church but I want to talk about another time where a church caught on fire and thousands came into the streets to watch it burn so go with me to Acts chapter 2 and we're going to be sitting there. I'm going to encourage you, and, and, and Acts is in the New Testament. I encourage you to hang out there all this week. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to go kind of through the whole chapter of Acts chapter 2. So I encourage you this week to go back and read through it. And we're going to put it right up here on the screen. We're going to be uh, reading out of the New Living Translation. We're going to start with verses 1 through 6. And this was at one time in history when people gathered thousands in the street to watch a church on fire. The scripture reads, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time... There were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. 
And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. This is that infamous moment in the Bible we talk about the day of Pentecost, the day of the birth of the church, the day where the 120 believers gathered and the promise of the Holy Spirit from Jesus came down on the church. And what's so interesting is that the church caught fire, and we're not talking about a building, we're talking people. Caught fire, the Holy Spirit came down upon them. So much that thousands came from all around to watch this place. They heard it first, but as you'll see, we'll continue. They see the fire that's burning in his church. And so for our guests, when you walked in the door today, you got a, a worship guide like this. There's these sermon notes that you'll see pop up here on the screen. And here's our first sermon note together. This, is, this moment in biblical history is, summarizes our whole sermon series called Ignite. And so here's that first note together. Combustion. Combustion is when a spark combined with fuel and oxygen ignite a church. And we've been walking through this since right after Easter, the very first weekend after Easter. We talked about how do we keep the fire going in the church? And so it starts with a spark. When we look at this, this, this formula here of what combustion takes. A spark was that encounter, the early apostles and disciples, it was that encounter with the risen Christ that was the spark. And then we went into what was the fuel. The fuel was understanding the freedom that they've been set free because of who Christ is and what he's done. They've all been set free. So now has freedom uh, to be really inflamed. And then we, we added in oxygen last week and Pastor Art shared about Jesus saying in Acts 1, he goes, now hold on a second. Jesus appeared to them for 40 days after he rose from the grave. He said, now hold on a second, there's one more thing we need in the chemistry here to make everything work. He says, wait, and I'll pour out. God will pour out the Spirit on all of us in the church, and that will complete the formula. And that's what happened on this day. The Holy Spirit came and the church, an encounter and freedom and the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, and now you have a church on fire. And when you have a church on fire like this, it attracts other people to the church. The fascination with fire continues. So that the purpose of this sermon series, Ignite, is to ensure that we as a church encounter Christ, that we understand the freedom that we now have because of Him, and that we just allow the Holy Spirit to change shape and light our fire. And when one person does that and it spreads to one other person that spreads throughout this church, you have a church on fire. And so whenever we read about fire in the Bible, we always see fire come one of two ways. It's normally considered a consuming fire, but it will consume us in one of two ways. And here's the next note. The fire can burn a church up or it can burn it down. The Lord's fire will either consume us from the inside out or it will condemn us from the outside in. God's consuming fire can actually be also a consuming fire of judgment for those who oppose God. That's a fire that consumes and destroys. The, the Lord rained down fire. We read in Sodom and Gomorrah and Genesis. Jesus talked about the eternal fire in Matthew in two places. He talked about either we take eternal life and move towards eternal life or there's eternal fire. But there's even this fire, this consuming fire can even impact the church. And I saw this quote from uh, John Wesley that I, I really thought still, even though it was written a long time ago, it still fits today. Let's look at this quote together. John Wesley said, my fear is not that our greatest movement, or, sorry, that our great movement, he's talking about the church, will eventually cease to exist or one day die from the earth. My fear is that people will become content to live without the fire, the power, the excitement, the natural element that makes us great. You can read, I don't know if I go a day without some email coming through, pastoral email about the decline of the church in America and the decline of the church in other areas of the world. But in America, you'll see the studies that show that anywhere that 60 to 85 percent of the churches in America are plateaued or declining in attendance and activity. 
And it's easy for me, I think sometimes I see all the data and, and to come to this one summary is that we're, the church has become content to live without fire. It starts with an absence of fire here in the heart of the individual. Revelations chapter 2 talks about the lampstands of the church, of the seven churches. That lampstand symbolizes the fire in a church, the fire of the Spirit and the light of Christ. And the scripture reminds us that lampstand can be removed from a church that lost its fire. And that kind of gets us that summary that this consuming fire that sometimes, it, not sometimes, a self-centered church without passion can burn itself out and down. That's the bad side of fire. Now let's get to the good side of fire. Let's talk about God's consuming fire that changes us. We also see a different aspect and a real positive aspect of God's fire that can consume and change. And so here's our next note together. This kind of fire, this fire that God has that consumes us, actually spreads, purifies, and it attracts. This is a fire we want here in every person. God's fire through the Holy Spirit, it, it first starts by spreading. It changes people in a church. It changes from person to person as that fire spreads through. And I was reading, like, through Matthew 3.11, when John the Baptist was saying, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming soon, he's talking about Jesus, who's greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy to even be his slave or carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And through Christ, each one of us starts changing the church. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, that fire will spread. This is the consuming fire we want to see. Not only does it spread, but it also purifies us. Malachi 3, chapter 3, it, it's a prophecy of Christ coming. It says, look, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away everything that's impure. That consuming fire of God purifies us. It changes us. It gets rid of the words dross, the garbage that when you purify gold and silver, the garbage that rises up, and you glean that off. And that's what God does as he purifies his church. And when you have a church that you see fire spread person to person, you see a church where that fire is changing people, you will see a church that attracts with that fire. I gave you a quote from John Wesley. Here's his brother, Chuck. <laughs> I can call him instantly Chuck. Charles Wesley said this. He said, you catch on fire with enthusiasm and watch people will come for miles to watch you burn. And there's truth to this. You catch on fire and you allow God's fire and that fire of the Holy Spirit to be in you. People will walk across your office space to see what it is that's burning about you. Kids in school, when you burn with the fire of Christ and the Holy Spirit in you, kids will come to you and walk over to your desk and wonder what it is about that fire that is in you. And when you have a church that's on fire, do you know how far people will drive to be part of that fire? They will drive a long ways. So let's continue the story of the early church in Acts chapter 2. The day that thousands came to watch a fire burn in a church. Your next note there. 120 believers impacted the lives of 3,000 people in one day. That's a fire. The early church, it talked about, back in Acts 1, it talked about 120 believers had gathered. And they impacted the lives of 3,000 people in one day. So we pick up in Acts 2, verse 41. And the scripture reads, those who believed. What had happened was a fire had come down on a church. It lit up its members. And Peter, it says, walks out to all those who had gathered with the other 11. And he shared the good news with everybody there. And this is what happened. It said, those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. Now let me, <laughs> let's make sure we all understand this. 3,000 had gathered in the streets. Peter had shared the good news. And 3,000 had come to a saving faith 
And do you know how much water it takes to baptize 3,000 people in one day? It's a lot. 120 people impacted the lives of 3,000 people in one day because of a fire. The Sunday after Easter here, we started the series with Ignite. We talked about the encounter with Christ. We baptized seven people in front of you who now know that fire. And what did we do? We cheered to fan those flames, didn't we? In the last eight months, we baptized 27. I know pastors always increase by two or three, but it's like around 27. But of those, were like 20 were new time confessions of faith. Can you see the fire spreading? And we go back to Acts and we see shortly after 3,000 were added to their number, a short time later we see that 5,000 were added to their number. And then we watch the church continue in the book of Acts of Fire, continues to spread outside of Jerusalem and it goes across national borders and it spreads throughout northern Africa into Asia and all the way over towards Rome. And the fire spreads. And we see people in every one of those stops, we see people that are purified, getting rid of the garbage in their lives and living a new full life. And we see that fire attract more and more and more. What started as 120 believers in one room is now 2.4 billion people today. That fire is still moving. And that early church remained on fire. The question is how? How did they keep that fire burning? So we're going to jump back into Acts 2, and we're going to verse 42. And this shares with us in Scripture of how that fire kept going. The Scripture reads, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of of all the people and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved so when we look at Acts 40, uh, chapter 2 42 through 47 we see kind of an element here is how does combustion stay inside a church how does that fire keep going and so this note is important here so combustion continues in people who tend that fire by these three things that we see in the scripture the first is gathering that fire was stoked and it kept going because of the commitment to gather together, to be together as a community of faith. They were committed to meet together, they were committed to belonging together. They shared themselves, they shared meals, and more importantly, they, they prayed together. They prioritized gathering. The next thing that we see is that in, these, in, this, in this early church, the next thing is, they, is that this fire was tended and the combustion continued because they were growing. It said they devoted themselves to teaching and to fellowship. They grew together. They come to an understanding of their faith together. Their eyes to the scripture opened up together, all in the work of the Holy Spirit through them. But they committed to growing together. And the third thing that we see here, how this combustion continued and how the church stayed on fire was their giving. They shared their time, their talent, and their treasure. They gave each other time. One of the most precious commodities we have was that we gave time as a priority to each other first. They used their talents to serve each other and to grow the body. And they gave their treasure they pooled their resources and money together to help each other out and continue the mission of the church. 
And, and we see in here this gathering, this growing, this giving, the, it resulted in awe. Awe is like, it's a fear, it's, a, it's, a, it's like it's an amazing thing watching God work and your jaw just kind of hits the ground and you can't believe what's happening each day. That's, that's awe. They're like, what is going on here? When you have 3,000 in one day be baptized, that's pretty awesome, don't you think? But there's like this awe. But they had this joy. It says not just joy, but great joy. This gathering, this growing, this giving. It brought them great joy that they couldn't find in anything else. And each day God added to their number. So this is the reason why every Sunday you hear this mantra a little bit from up here about church is not coming on Sunday for an hour and worshiping God in song and we hear a sermon and we go home and that's good. And, and let me make a point why. The number one mission of our church, our number one focus is, is for disciples to make disciples. That is our call. That is our mission. We are to grow in our knowledge of Christ and we are to grow others, every one of us. Nobody's excluded in that. We are disciples making disciples. So keeping that in mind, that, that is a mission of, of this church, this lively body, 24-7. I want you to remember in the last three and a half years, how, how many of my sermons do you remember? Okay, I got one comment in first service. I'm making a point. The, the sermon is not designed, and while it has some discipleship properties, the sermon is not designed to disciple you. The sermon is, not, is designed to motivate us every Sunday. We worship together to empower us as we go out in the Spirit during the week, and we are the church all week long. So you, c yeah, thank you for not remembering one sermon in three and a half years, but <laughs> I want you to remember the name of the person who walked with you, came to you the worst part of your life, and made a difference in your life and shaped your faith. And I bet you all have a name there. Because that's who we're to be as a church. That's the importance of discipleship. You want to find our joy and our fire and our passion. It's when we come together, we grow together, and we give for each other. I can't believe nobody knew one sermon. That's just incredible. <laughs> See, funny. It's a little bit funny. So anyway... So we have a fire challenge, a fire challenge. How do we keep the fire burning here at Westview? How do we keep gathering, we keep growing, we keep giving? We have a lot of people here gathering, growing, giving. There is fire that is clearly evident within our church and the ministries and what God has called us to do around the world and right here in Manhattan. You can see the people in our church who have that fire. That fire is in their eyes. That fire is in their speech. That fire is in their hands. But we will not stop until everybody here is on fire. And we have room for this in our church. That all of us can be on fire. And when you have, you know, four to five hundred people that call this church home out on fire, wow. Wow. So there's a way we can do this, and if you look here on the back of your worship guide, there's this little tear-off part in gray, and it talks about these three areas, gathering, growing, and giving. And we want to give you an on-ramp to make sure you're involved in all three of these so we stoke the fire. Do you know, I think Tracy Weaver was telling me, it's like, it's like think of a grill. You know, it's like when you've got a grill and you put all those coals in the middle, they burn hot and they keep burning hot, but what happens in a grill when you move those charcoal out to the outer rim? What do they do? They burn out. They become cold. Staying gathered, growing and giving is how that stays hot. One way here is that this little thing says, help light my heart. Remember we talked about the change here is, is in my heart. And when my heart is changed by who Christ is and what he's done, my hair is on fire. And that's when people notice. So how do, we keep the how do we keep the fires burning here, gathering? The first thing I want to talk about is membership. And you can get all wound up about membership, what is your thing. It is biblical. It is a commitment to who we are. 
And everything that, that we're talking about here, growing, giving, everything together, membership is just simply that commitment. And if that's something you haven't even started with, is like, I've never really committed to this body. Just check that box, put your information down there, and we're going to connect with you about what that is. Second thing is growing. If you're not part of a group that's growing during a week, actively engage with somebody else, iron sharpening iron, somebody pouring into you, you're going to be a coal that's moved out to the side of the grill and just cools off. And our goal is to have 100% of us. On Sunday, we have great opportunities, but all through the week. And actually, we're going to take next week off because it's Memorial Day weekend, but this brand new guide is right outside here at our worship center that shows everything that's going on this summer. And you don't even have to go by this. If you want to start something new, all you got to do is call Art and let him know, and we'll take care of you. But you need to be back in there amongst the other coals and growing and learning and you can start this summer. If I've never been in a small group, today is a great day to plug in. And there's all these different choices that can meet you where you're at. So check that box, 100% of us. Uh, many of you got this. I'm okay. I'm not picking on you today at all. G keep going. Keep that fire stoked. Keep your coal close together. But if, if, we're, if some of us are missing these areas, check this today. And let's go after 100% of us. The third is giving. And I'm specifically talking about serving is that God, the day that we believe, the Holy Spirit gave each one of us a gift that changes this community. Each one of you, every one of you, it's clear, has a gift that changes this community. And that fire's hot when you're using that gift. And you might be saying, Brian, I don't even know what that gift is. That's okay, check that box. We will help you discover that gift. But all of us together, stoking that fire. And there's one always opportunity that we always have. It's always I think this is this is common in many churches is is that we have a lot of opportunities to serve to our children, and this is always the area's hardest. It seems like to get people, and, and we want to be within your gifting, but we want you to consider this. This is the generation that keeps the fire going in our church. And we have to spend a lot of time investing in our children and our youth to keep this going. And so I want to show you a beautiful video here, and then Katie's going to come and talk about this, the opportunities that we have to ensure the next generation of this church stays on fire. Hi, I'm Marla Kane. I, my spot on the team is the coordinator for the nursery. And I'm always looking for volunteers to help. It doesn't matter your age or man, woman. We would love to have you. My name is Christy Band, and my spot is here in the nursery with the littlest of the littles. And I think that it is very important to be here for the sake of the children, but also it frees up their parents so that they can grow and serve in our church. Hi, my name is Kaylin, and my spot is with the toddlers. One time I was walking out in the hallway, and this little girl, she was in with the two and threes, and she moved up into the four and fives. So she grabbed my leg and she said, Kaylin, will you come up with me? And then she went over to her dad and she was like, Dad, look at my friends. And I was like, oh, we're friends. I'm Darby and I'm with the pre-K and kindergartners. And I think it is important to have the kids ministry just to kind of build a foundation for the kids and just get them involved in the church at an early age and build some community with kids their own age. My name is Katie Pulaski and my spot is with the elementary kids. Um, I love working with the elementary kids because the lessons we teach them, I learn so much from them myself and I learn so much from them. Um, I've also learned a lot about what to expect as my son gets a little bit older, what the kids are worried about today and so it's just such a blessing getting to spend that time with your kids. Hi, I'm Christy and my spot is with the elementary. I enjoy watching them grow up and seeing how they mature through the years and when they start grasping some of those concepts. 
I'm Donna Cranford and my spot is with the elementary kids and I really enjoy working with a team of dedicated adults that really love kids and are invested in them and together we can really provide an environment that is warm and welcoming and uh, where they can learn about Jesus and have, learn to have a personal relationship with him. Hi, I'm in the Grapples Kid Group and we need more leaders who are older than wiser in us to find a spot. I am the leader in Grapple class, uh, fourth and fifth graders, and we have a blast here, but I need some help. It's important to have kid ministry because these are the leaders that are coming up, and if we don't have anybody to lead them, how can they learn to lead them? So please come and join us. Hello, my name is Katie, and I am blessed to work with our first through fifth graders a couple times every month. And the question we have for you today is what does this spot, what do these spots say to you? In each of us, there's a spot, an empty spot that needs to be filled. Unfortunately, from the day we're born, we try to fill it with the wrong things. We know we have this spot, and we know it needs to be filled. We just can't seem to figure out what to place in it. The only thing that can fill that spot is Jesus Christ. And that's why it's such a privilege to minister our children. We get to introduce them to Christ at an early age and help change the course of their lives. Join our West Kids team this summer to help kids fill their spot with the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Um, out, out there in the hallway after service, there's a table with a big Dalmatian dog with spots. Uh, you can't miss it. Uh, there will be some people there to help you learn about the opportunities that we have in Kidsmen. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. So, yeah, so there's your ramps. There is a ramp out there to help us with our children, continue that generation to keep moving that direction. There's also this ability here. If we're missing in one of these areas, please check that box today. Uh, you can drop that right in our offering basket or leave it at our Welcome Center on the way out. We'll make sure that we're going to connect with you. We're ready to go. We'll connect with you and we'll walk with you through that and get you on, uh, ramped on to those areas that you need, that you want to grow and be that fire. Let me wrap up here just with uh, this quote is from Leonard Ravenhill. He's, he's an evangelist and author. He's, he's known for inspiring the Western church, the church in America, to, to find their passion again and find their heart to be on fire. And he says, he said this, he said, you never have to advertise a fire. He said, everyone comes running when there's a fire. Likewise, if your church is on fire, you will not have to advertise it. The community will already know it. And that's the kind of church we want to be on fire. We're there. We got room for 100% of us to be there. Amen? Ushers, would you come forward, please, for the offering? And, and let's bow our heads together in prayer. And this is a time where we give back. And so let's all examine our hearts together. Heavenly Father, I pray that these boxes here, that they actually mean a lot, that this is how the fire of our church continues going. We, we do not like the word average. We do not like, because there's nothing about you, God, that's average. We want to be a church that always has that fire, and that we're always stoking that fire. Father, help us encourage every one of us to be gathering, growing, and giving. And so that's our first offering to you, Father, is we're checking a box to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a coal by myself, and I feel cold. I'm burning out. Father, bring us together as one church on fire, hearts on fire, hairs on fire together, and that we give, we just give. Father, we give out of a joyous heart, and we go out and we impact our community. We pray all this in the mighty name of Christ. Amen.